From the late 90s to 2011, Harry Potter became one of the biggest franchises in the world. You could not go anywhere without seeing some sort of Harry Potter content. The books on their own were already a sensation, but when Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone movie was released, its future success was undeniable. The second film, Chamber of Secrets, then followed and featured my favorite film character of all time, Dobby. Hmm. Okay, so of course they made video games for the movies, and one of our favorite games ever, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets for PlayStation 2. Little fun fact about Dobby, I used to think that his species was a little freak, but I found out by reading the books that he's actually something called a house elf. Yeah, it's not really a fun fact. We wanted to see if it was actually any good, so we downloaded it and played it again. Another fun fact about Dobby. <clears throat> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Dobby's toes actually- He's not in the game. Sorry, what? They cut him from the game. He's not in it at all. They don't even reference him. Excuse me for a sec. Stop. Stop. It's just one character. So I think the most important question to start with is, what would someone want out of a Harry Potter game? Well, every kid who loved the movies at the time wanted to go to Hogwarts just like Harry, Ron, and Hermione. Uh, yeah, like, I mean, look at me as a kid. You look like Harry Potter. Right, Tony, that's what I'm trying to say. We'd argue that the feeling of going to school, exploring the castle, going to class, and experiencing the world are more important than how fun it is to cast a spell. Right, when we're talking about a movie game like, say, Spider-Man, the gameplay needs are very different. You want to be able to swing around the city like Peter Parker, but a Harry Potter game needs to provide more immersion than clean movement or a fun gameplay loop. Chamber of Secrets spans across only five days at Hogwarts in this game. You know, the complete school year experience. Right. And obviously five days is pretty limited, but the cool thing about it is that you can freely explore Hogwarts. After you've done your tasks and you're tired of exploring, you get to personally choose when to end the day. And when the day ends, you can now freely sneak around the castle at night. This gives a really cool feeling of controlling your schedule as a student at the school. Right, and during the day you can attend class, learn spells, practice and play Quidditch, find lost items for other students and explore the castle however you want. Attending the classes is how you learn spells, but only if you're Harry Potter apparently. <laughs> we would have loved some interesting classroom gameplay to learn spells, but every class in the game boils down to the professor singling Harry out of the crowd and throwing him in a dungeon to fight gargoyles until he learns the spell of the day. Apparently no other student in the movies or games or books learns anything across any year but <laughs> Harry Potter. Quidditch was surprisingly cool cool and a highlight of the game for us. Yes. It wasn't super complex or anything, but racing your broom against another seeker while other players fly by in the background is more than we expected from a 2002 minigame. Also, Jeremy Soul, who did the music for Skyrim and other Elder Scrolls titles, composed the music for this game and absolutely killed it. Did a great job. It was amazing. I mean, listen to this Quidditch theme. <laughs> Obviously, the game isn't a perfect free exploration open world experience like, say, Breath of the Wild. There's a pretty linear to-do list for each day, but the choice of when to do them is enough to make you feel like you're never being forced to do anything, and you have your own daily schedule at the school. And like we said, the game needs to nail the feeling of going to school like the students in the books and movies. All of the things you can do at the school and the freedom to do them accomplishes this goal extremely well, especially for a movie game from 2002. There were a ton of Harry Potter games over the years. Some were better at this goal, and some were worse. Wow! Bertie Boss Beans! But Chamber of Secrets for the PS2 is regarded as one of the best at this core gameplay, and we know there's a PC version out there God, do we know. that had a cooler way of casting spells, and it's probably good, and we might play it in the future. We just didn't play it for this video. Better get out of here. Filch might be lurking nearby. Well, well, well. I heard a crash and what do I find? If there's one thing a Harry Potter game really needs to get right, it's Hagrid. Hagrid has to be huge. Hagrid is simply massive in this game. Hagrid is 
and I hate to say simply again, he's simply huge. <laughs> look at his arms. Look at his legs. Look at his stance. Look at his beard. Hagrid needs to be so big that I get scared. Look how fucking massive he is. It's been a long day. I'm for a nice mug of cocoa and a good night's sleep. It's not nighttime. It's the middle of the day. Oh, and Tony, I, I think we're forgetting. There's a less important pillar to Harry Potter game that they also need right, to get right. I guess. Obviously, another pillar of a Harry Potter game is the world, especially Hogwarts. And for a 2002 version of the castle, it's really incredible. It's obviously much smaller than the real scale, but it feels like a giant version of Hogwarts for the time. And the art style of the game seems to be a combination of the first two movies and the illustrations of the first two books. And honestly, for 2002, it looks really good compared to games of that year. The face models are cartoonish, but they're also expressive. Obviously, it doesn't look amazing, but for the time it looks really good and as a result holds up pretty well today. It didn't give us that nagging feeling of how poorly a game has aged like some older games do. Right, and the interior of Hogwarts is also really well done. For example, the grand staircase shifts and separates just like the movies and is used as a sort of hub for most of the levels and areas. And like we said, it clearly isn't a scale model of Hogwarts, but it has all the hits from the first two movies. A ton of recognizable rooms that fans would know and love like the Great Hall, the Grand Staircase, the Chamber of Secrets, the Quidditch Field, and more. Dobby's Corner. Okay, and so you really feel like you're there. Also at night, you have to sneak around the castle and avoid getting caught by the hall monitors or prefects for the nerds out there. And they are so weirdly angry and villainous for no reason. I mean- They are crazy aggressive. Yeah, just listen to this. There's something wrong here. Hey, lost him. Go back to the dormitory, Potter. You shouldn't be out at night. Go back to the dormitory. Like, calm down, <laughs> dude. You're another student. Like, we, we go to geometry <laughs> together. Fucking cool it. Locomotive artist. Where did he go? I must have been hearing things. If there's one thing a Harry Potter game needs to get right at its core, it's the spells. And in Chamber of Secrets, there are a set of spells you learn throughout the game. Some are attack spells, some deflect other spells, and some light up dark rooms, and a good deal of them unlock secret chests or help with new puzzles. So you learn a ton of spells throughout the game, but you can only bind three spells to three buttons at once, which lets you customize which spells you want ready on hand and which buttons that feel right to bind them to. And we think that is awesome, especially when you get the Nimbus 2000. That's not just a broomstick, Harry. It's a Nimbus 2000. Since I was a kid, I've always remembered the part of this game where they give you the broom to bind as one of your spell buttons so you can pull it out when you're outside of Hogwarts and fly around. It's one of my favorite gaming memories as a kid, and we were so pleasantly surprised to find that it actually holds up and is pretty fun. And when you start flying, they have special composed music that is just made as flying music to amp you up as you're flying around Hogwarts. It's a kid's dream if you were a fan at the time. And I, I like the flying and Quidditch, but I did feel like the stick was way too sensitive for Harry, so I was like flinging him around trying to get through the rings in the Quidditch matches. Right, and I uh, was good at flying, so I didn't have that problem. Okay, well, whatever. That doesn't matter to this video, but okay. I feel like the average person who's played the game would hear you say that, and they'd go, maybe kid, good, or maybe Eddie's really good, so we want to hear from him. Pretty good at it, but yeah, right, I just and was I was right. I would be what they would call one of the greats. The camera in the game is a fucking nightmare. The left stick, instead of rotating around a character like in a modern third person game, peaks to the left or peaks to the right of Harry, which is not how games should work at all. Then you have the lock on feature for where you want to cast a spell, and it's a disaster. It doesn't even work half the time, and when it fails, it whips the camera around in a weird direction and makes you motion sick. Which is especially terrible at the spider part, which I have a little bit of an arachnophobia. Just like a little bit. Or a lot of it. I don't like the spiders. I don't really like when they show up in games and I struggle with it a little bit. I still do it, but it's uncomfortable. So when I had to run through the forest and there's a bunch of spiders jumping at me and I try to lock onto one and Harry turns around instead, it is terrifying. 
So the story sort of loosely follows the book and movie. It kind of feels like the writer of the game used spark notes to structure the script. It feels like they skimmed the spark notes, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> the only major story elements that are in the game are the polyjuice potion, the spider part, the chamber of secrets, and Diagon Alley. Everything else is learning spells and playing Quidditch. By the way, Speaking of Diagon Alley, oh boy. there's a moment in all of Harry Potter that always bothers me and Tony so mm -hmm. much. We'll just you can just see it. Diagon Alley. Very good. Now don't forget to speak very, very clearly. Diagon Alley. Harry. Harry. Come she on. just said. She just said the it. The one right thing she the said second ago was don't mispronounce it. What does he say? Diagon Alley. Diagon Alley. Idiot. Moron. Loser, I'd say. The story not being exactly retold is not necessarily a bad thing. Clearly, the game wanted to give a Hogwarts experience more than anything. But it is a game based on a book and a movie that follow the same story. The ending of the game has a narrator, who shows up twice, recap a bunch of the major plot points that happened, but never actually occurred in the game. Which I think is probably a real hit to the story when you think about the fact that every Harry Potter year is defined by its story. Mm -hmm. So as a movie, movie game adaption or a book game adaption, whatever you want to call it, it's pretty good, but it seems like they sacrificed the book and movie story for the going to school immersion part. Which I think we both agree was a good trade-off and made a better video game and a better Harry Potter game overall. Right, so it's a better general Harry Potter game, but a slightly worse Chamber of Secrets game for it. it absolutely. Overall, we think this is definitely one of the best movie games of the 2000s, and we know along with us is a childhood favorite for a lot of people. I mean, what other game lets you just bully Percy like this? <laughs> Fuck Percy, honestly. Fuck I fucking Percy. hate Percy. If you play the game, Fuck do you, it Percy. as much as you can. Fuck you, Percy. And I, I think after replaying some childhood favorites, I always get nervous when we're about to play the best ones because I'm afraid it won't be what I remembered. And that's not the case for us here. It seems to be almost exactly what we remembered as kids. The idea of exploring a unique castle filled with mysterious areas to explore is such an engaging concept for a kid, and this gameplay definitely delivers on that feeling. You know, in recent years, years, Harry Potter has been associated with some controversy and some millennial cringe, but the series meant a lot to us as kids and was a huge part of us spending time with our older sister, yeah. and that's why we love this game so much. Obviously, it's still a game from 2002, so it's not perfect, but it's still pretty good today. Especially because there aren't really any games currently that scratch that same itch for us, you know, maybe Persona 5, but we haven't played that fully, so I'm not just gonna sit here and lie to you like a liar. No, I only played a couple hours. Yeah, all I'll say is I don't know a game that scratches this itch that isn't an anime game, and yeah. I would like one. No hate to anime, I watch a good deal of it, but I just would like one that's not. Also, no other game has a Hagrid that big. Not Warzone, not Fortnite, none. Not a single one of them. So is Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets any good? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I'd say so. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, I'm, it's not, I'm not going to, you know, scream from the rooftops about it, but it's no, fun. It's, I mean, it's like... It's fun. It's yeah. It's good. Yeah, but it's I like, like it. it's not like great. It's just it's good. Yeah. No, that's good what time. good means. You don't even have to say that. No, that's what I'm saying. Right, but you said the thing that you don't need to say. Exactly. Right. Don't, stop saying that like you're agreeing with me. I'm saying that you said something you didn't need to say. And that's why it's a good game. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs>